So these guys have told you all about the trees and the water and the geology. And now I'm going to focus down a little bit finer scale on the, um, the smaller plants, the rare plants, the non-native invasive plants, commonly called weeds, and also what they call non-timbered forest products or special products, which is things other than trees that can be used commercially. So I'm going to start with the rare plants. That's the main thing I do. I'm a botanist here. I'm a um, seasonal employee, and we we work all the botany work out of the supervisor's office on the whole course. So there's a forest botanist, and then myself. I'm kind of the crew leader, and then we have a few other summer health people that do a lot of our survey work. So for rare plants, this includes what you think of as a normal plant. They call them vascular plants, where they can transport water. Oops. Okay, there we go. And then there's also non-vascular plants, which is the mosses and liverworts, the little tiny plants that all water has to just diffuse through the plants. And then we also actually have a rare lichen, which a lichen is a plant that's it's a fungus and an algae that grow together. And then we even have one rare mushroom on our rare list, which is a fungus. And then so for the rare plants, there's kind of a range of how rare things really are. So the most rare would be something that's on the federal endangered species list as either uh, endangered or threatened. And this is an example of a threatened plant, the Parlance four o'clock. However, that doesn't grow around here. Those are the Snake River. And luckily for us, there are no federally listed plants on the Malheur National Forest anywhere. And as far as we know, there's no habitat. So we don't have to do any consultation with Fish and Wildlife Service for rare plants. And, but there is what they call the Forest Service calls sensitive species. And what these are, I'll just read you this definition from our manual, is species identified for which population viability is a concern, as evidenced by significant current or predicted downward trends in population numbers, density, or habitat capability that would reduce a species existing distribution. So they, we make up this list based on input from all the people around the region. And then every few years they update this list based on what people have found. And the ultimate goal of this sensitive list is to keep things from becoming onto the federal list. And the thing about rare plants is they're rare because usually where they grow is some kind of an unusual place. So they're on these special habitats like cliffs or talus slopes or in wetlands, seeps, springs, places like that. So just in the general dry forest, there really isn't a whole lot of plants to be rare because there's so much of that dry forest that there's plenty of habitat for most of those plants. So the main thing that we really work towards is trying to have as part of our prescriptions to protect those little special habitat areas by buffering them or making sure they don't drive um, equipment across them or pile um, big slice piles on top of the scabs and things like that. So what are we doing when we're doing our botany surveys? Like I said, we have limited people, so we can't really just cover every single acre of ground. So we zoom in on, like we study what these rare plants are and where we might find them, what kind of special habitats we're we looking for. So we go out and look for those. We look on the air photos ahead of time or talk to people. We go out and then we also, for the weed, we look along the rows because that's where they tend to be is along the rows where the they have a corridor for spread. And then also we tend to focus on areas where we know there's going to be ground disturbance, where there will be the most impact. And then we'll also go back and look at these old sites. We've been keeping records ever since they first started hiring botanists around 1990 or so, I think, around here. So we've got all these old records. A lot of these sites nobody's been back to since they were first found. So we go back to these old sites. And then an important thing for us is, even though we're focusing on these certain plants, we try and identify every single species because you just never know what unusual thing you might find. So uh, for the big mosquito area, on the Malheur National Forest, there's potentially 88 species of sensitive plants. There's 22 that have actually been found on this forest. And in big mosquito, there were seven species known. And so of those, I'm just gonna go real quick over a few of these. Moonworts were the main thing that are found in this area. And they're kind of a more northern species. They're more common up around Canada. And because this area is the most northern part of the Mount Here National Forest, it's the wettest, it's the coldest, so we have good habitat for these. And they tend to grow in wet meadows, riparian areas. Um, they're very, very tiny. They're very labor-intensive to try and go find them. They don't even always come up. 
So really, rather than trying to find every single one of these little crazy plants, the better plan is to try and protect their habitat as much as we can. And this is one that we found up in this project area. There was three, actually, different species. And they're also very hard to tell apart. There's the expert guy. He runs, like, molecular gels to figure them out. So. And another plant we found out there this summer, it's related to the moonworts. It's called the adder's tongue. It's in the same family. It also has spores. Um, and again, if we can just protect these meadows, we should be able to protect these. And this species, this is the first time it's been found on this forest. So that was really an exciting thing. Um, this is a species I've known from a few other places, but it had never been found here before. And then there's actually even a couple of rare mosses that are found in this plant area. Um, we actually have one of our field people as a specialist on these kind of plants. And so he's gone out and documented a couple spots of these. Again, they're in the wet meadows or along creeks and things. Um, and then interestingly enough, there's actually a rare tree on our list, the white bark pine. And you wonder, well, how can such a widespread common thing be considered a rare plant? Well, white bark pine, I'm sure a lot of you have heard all this, but there's uh, white pine blister rust that's a non-native fungus that's been introduced to the western United States, and it'll kill these trees. So it's been put on this list because of concern over this rust. And there are some plants known right near the edge in the northeast corner. There is some white bark pine documented. Um, I don't know, actually, in the project area. But um, there's no treatments planned up in that area. And the forest has actually been going out and collecting seed. And they're working at Dorena at the tree center to try and get rest resistant um, trees of these to plant back eventually. Um, and then other plants that are just interesting, they're not really on our rare list, but Pacific yew is actually pretty common up in that area. Um, I'm kind of new to this area, so I don't know how widespread it is on this forest, but it's probably not, you know, it wouldn't be down in the southern part or in the real dry areas. And it's in the Cascade Mountains, and then I know that like in the northern Wallowas, it's fairly common. But this tree, several years ago, they decided it's got a chemical in it that helps fight breast cancer called Taxol. And there was a whole big thing. Everybody's trying to find out where all these trees were, and they were mapping them, and people were collecting the bark. Well, and then they were able to now synthesize it chemically so they don't have to collect it from the trees anymore. But it just, this kind of illustrates the importance of conserving all plants because you never know really what, what might be in that plant that could be of use. And just as another little aside, these traditionally, they use the wood of this is really hard and it's been used for like making uh, bows and arrows and stuff traditionally. And then another kind of interesting plant that we found in the project area is this called stiff club moss. It's another real primitive plant. And it's also found in the wet meadows up in the northern part of the area. And as far as I can tell, it's the first time this plant's been found in the Mountain Air National Forest. It's actually fairly common on the Wallow Whitman up in the uh, Alcorns and Wallowas. But this is a plant, when I first started working, it was on the sensitive list. So we were all going out, and every time we'd find it, we'd get all excited. But it, by doing that, and part of the whole goal of this program is we found out it's really not as rare as we thought. It's just that nobody had ever really documented it. So now it's been found, it's not that rare, it's been actually taken off the sensitive <coughs> species list, which is the goal of, of our program. So now moving on to kind of the other extreme is the um, non-native invasive plants. Um, the botanists, we look for these also when we do our surveys. And traditionally, you, you call it weeds. You know, a lot of people go, well, isn't everything a weed? But really a weed, traditionally, it's called a plant out of place. It's a plant where you don't want it to be or it's causing some kind of a problem. But now the Forest Service kind of narrows it down to it has to be a non-native plant and that they spread into native ecosystems and displace the native plants. And they can increase potential for soil erosion, reduce water quality, and degrade habitat. So that's why we care. And there's there's a whole state list of these noxious weeds also. And so in the Mountaineer National Forest, right now prevention is the main strategy we use. We put things in our contracts to wash equipment before you bring it in, keep the weeds out, um, and we put these project design criteria. And so right now, due to some old lawsuits that have happened, the Mountaineer National Forest cannot spray herbicides or use biological control agents. The only tools are weed whacking or brush cutting or pulling weeds, which is really inefficient way to go about business. But that's all we have right now. So right now there's a 
draft environmental impact statement out for public comment. I think the comment closes January 5th or 6th. So that one, if everything goes according to plan, and this um, alternative selected could potentially include use of biological control agents where you have little bugs that eat plants and herbicides as well as the mechanical methods. So depending on how that comes out, we may have more tools in the future. And so specific to Big Mosquito, we have on our GIS layer approximately 300 acres of mapped weeds. We know there's actually a lot more out there, but our works in this summer hasn't been put in there yet. And most of these sites are along road sites. Luckily, most of the plants stay in disturbed areas. They don't spread into non-disturbed. Um, but one weed that I'm particularly concerned about out there is the sulfur sink foil. It's very common in the planting area. It's a fibrous rooted perennial, and so it's really hard to kill without herbicides. You, you have to try and dig it, which a fibrous rooted perennial is really hard to get at all. Um, and I found this plant does not just grow along the roads. It's out in some of these meadows, in these old meadows that it's growing out there also. And then the other big one that's out there is the St. John's wort. We have 55 acres. It's another rhizomatous perennial. Um, and this is one that other places they've had really good luck with these beetles. They're called Chrysalina beetles, and they actually eat the eat the little flowers and everything, so they can't produce more seeds. Um, so hopefully we can start releasing these again on them also. And then another interesting plant that we found is not on the noxious weed list, but it's a it's called perennial quaking grass, and it's an escape garden ornamental. And we found it in two places in the planting area. One was a, by an old homestead, and the other by some mining ponds. And this, we actually sent it off to Oregon State University to make sure we identify it right, because this is the first time it's ever been found in Oregon, outside of like in somebody's garden. And so this is just kind of illustrates the importance of trying to figure out everything you see out there, because you just don't know what you're going to come across. And it was actually a really cute little grass. Um, so then the last little subject I want to talk about is the non-timber forest products, because we're always talking about the timber sales and um, you know, the big trees and all that. But really there's a lot of commercial value from other things too. And so the Forest Service Manual, they say, the objective is to sell other forest products where it would serve the local needs and also meet land management objectives. So for here, on this forest, the main thing is firewood and posts and poles. So for the Blue Mountain District, so far to December 1st, they had sold 685 permits 3,300 cords of wood, $16,000 was collected. And one thing I asked when I was looking into this, I said, well, what about commercial firewood permits? How many of those have we sold? And I was told, we don't sell commercial firewood permits here. It's all personal use. And then whenever, once the person cuts it down, they can do whatever they want with it. So rather than, where I've worked on the law with we had a separate program for commercial. You had to get a special permit. But here, that's not the case. So some of those cords of wood, people could have been making a living off of selling something that wood. And post and poles, not so much. And then the other big thing that can have commercial value around here is the morel mushrooms, which we all know about. Um, they come up in the spring, they come up really thick after fires, or even from logging or from um, animal trails, any kind of disturbance. Prices are very highly variable, anywhere from a dollar a pound to six dollars a pound, depending on the current year, what's going on in China or the weather, or how many big fires there were. And they're an important recreational resource. Everybody goes out to get their mushrooms in the spring with their little family trips. And it will, if there's a big fire, you'll get a lot of people coming from outside the community, and they eat at the restaurants, buy groceries, stay in motels, and all that. And then the other big one, although it's not so much a commercial thing around here, is the huckleberries. People gather them for mostly here, it's more for personal use or the Native Americans as a first food plant. And the fruiting can be enhanced by fire or opening up of the canopy. Um, and the crops depend each year, it can be different depending on the weather. And so I think in this project area, there's a lot of huckleberries. And this may be a place where there is an opportunity that as some of our silviculture we can maybe try and enhance the bushes, maybe make some more bigger openings to let more sunshine into the plants and stuff. And that was it, pretty much. Um, 
I just wanted to say in conclusion, you know, the Forest Service, we're really well known for looking at the trees and what's up in the sky and all that and um, the values of the trees. But I want you all to remember, there's also the, all the little plants too down there and the, the non-timber things we need to take care of also. And as part of our mandate as Forest Service to look out for all of the plant species, not just 